Audrey. Let's go. Time to go, Audrey. Make sure you feed the guinea pig. Make sure the water is filled. Bruno needs nourishment. Let's go. Hey, Noah. Noah, it's been plenty long in the bathroom. Let's go, man. Let's go. Micah. Hey, Micah. Set down your weights. Yes, I know. I know. It takes effort to look that good. Come on, Micah. Let's go. Nathan. Hey, Nathan. Nathan, you can finish that edit on that video later. Come on, dude. We got to go. Let's go upstairs. Let's go. You ever called out your kids like that? I find myself calling out for my kids like that a lot. Maybe you remember what it was like to be called out as well by your parents. Always being called. You're the called out ones of God, dear people of God. You and I have been called out out of darkness into the most marvelous light of the living Lord Jesus Christ. And the word that is translated in English as the church literally means in the Greek language, the called out ones. That's what it means to be part of the people of God. That's what it means to be part of the church, that you have been called out of this world You have been called out from sin and death. You have been called out of darkness into the most marvelous light of the living Lord Jesus Christ, who died so that we may live, who lives so that we may never die. We have been called out. And then when God calls us to salvation in Jesus Christ, he also puts us in the presence of other people. And he gathers us together as his forever family. That there is no end to this family of God. There is no end to this church that we are part of. It extends way, way, way back in the past. Literally all the way to Adam and Eve. It is manifest now as we gather together in this congregation and in assemblies of Christians throughout the world. And in the future, it will be fully realized when we will be gathered together in the presence of Jesus in heaven with those who have gone before us and who are already with Christ, with those who love him now and one day will stand before him in glory. And yes, even for those who have not even been born and yet will one day come to faith in Jesus Christ. We've been called out Hey, let's go by the Father of all mercy and grace. We've been called out and gathered together as his forever family. And that is a blessing that we celebrate this day and every day, especially today as we focus upon what Pentecost is. Pentecost shows us that the birthday of the church took place because the Holy Spirit of God established the people of God as his church, and he not only establishes the people of God, but he sustains them. So he not only creates us, he takes care of us. He not only redeems us by the blood of the cross, but he forgives us every time we come before him in repentance and faith. He not only filled us with his spirit in our baptism, but his spirit dwells within us, enabling us with our hearts to believe and our mouths to confess Jesus and his saving name. And so God, through his Son, and through the gift of his Holy Spirit, establishes the Christian church and sustains it to the very end of the age. I was reflecting upon this this last week as I was spending some time down in our discipleship center, getting ready for a wedding that took place yesterday, and also trying to clean up the youth room as we're excited to have youth groups start up again this August. And as I was looking at the hallway, I was reminded of some uh, prints and some uh, newspaper clippings and some photographs that we have from the earliest days of this congregation, Mount Olive Lutheran Church. It's already been seven years ago when we gathered to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the chartering of Mount Olive. And so way back in 1995, there was a group of people, some of whom are here in this room today, who signed their names to a charter and established themselves as a Lutheran congregation right here. 
So that was 1995. It was four years later that this building was completed. But the church is not a building. The church is the called out ones of God. The church is the people of God. And so in 95, they chartered themselves, but that's not where God established this church. Actually, he established it back in 94, when there were several families who had been part of other congregations on the south side of Indianapolis who came together and decided that God was going to lead them and guide them and provide for them to build a church here and to be here in White River Township, be here in the Center Grove area. And look at what, by God's grace, that has become to this day. That God established a church, He sustains His church, but then I go back to not only 95, I go back to 94, and then I wonder, I wonder when God established that vision in the lives of people like Nancy and Art and Janine and Jeff and Carl and Jeanette and Cindy and Keith, and others who have gone before us, some of whom are with the Lord in glory, some of whom have moved out of the state, some of whom have moved to other congregations. But I wonder, when did God establish in their hearts a desire to be part of a new called-out congregation that is the church? Because God knew, even before the creation of the world, that his people would be his people in Jesus. That's a mind-blowing mystery, that God knew us and who we would be in Christ even before we were formed in the womb of our mom. And God also knew the days of Mount Olive Lutheran Church. He knew because he establishes his church, and he sustains his church, and he lives and he reigns as the king of his church. It's not mine. It's not yours. It belongs to God. And we have been called to manage and steward and take care of what is rightfully His. Because through the water and through the word of holy baptism, God has laid His claim upon this church and He's laid His claim upon our individual lives. You know, when you go and you lay your claim upon something, that means that it belongs to you. And that's what God has done. He's laid His claim upon your life. I'm going to preach over in southern Illinois later this afternoon at a congregation that was founded by a bunch of German immigrants who settled in a beautiful part of the country called Randolph County, Illinois. And way back in 1840, there was a group of German-speaking Lutherans who had come to the far west, Illinois, and they went down there near the Mississippi River in a beautiful county, Randolph County, and they laid down their roots. And they named this little town Bremen. Over in Germany, it was Bremen, but they started to do the Southern Illinois way, Bremen. And so they established the church there as their community. They established it as kind of the hub of their life. And they call it St. John's Lutheran Church. Well, I didn't know a whole lot about St. John Lutheran Church until the past 10, maybe 15 years when my dad was telling me more about my family history. And I learned that there are several of my ancestors who were part of that congregation from the earliest days. And then, lo and behold, in 2008, there is a couple with their two kids who walks into this church. And I call them Cousin Sherry and Cousin Wally. Craig and Sherry Wall, and their kids Noah and Jake. And when I started talking with Craig and Sherry, I realized that they were from the same neck of the woods that I grew up in. And then I started talking with Wally, and I found out that he grew up in a little, little town on Route 3 in southern Illinois called Ellis Grove. And I said, Ellis Grove, I said, that's pretty close to Chester and, and Evansville and even Steelville, right? And he said, yeah, I went to Sparta High School. And I said, well, my grandparents, both Grandma Alexander and Grandpa Alexander, grew up right near Steelville, Illinois. He goes, yeah, that's my area. I said, where'd you go to church? He said, I went to a little church called St. John Lutheran in Bremen out in the country. I said, are you kidding? I said, I've got like three sets of my great-grandparents buried in that church cemetery. And he said, yeah, that's my church. I was, I was confirmed there. My, my family still goes there. I said, you literally are my brother from another mother. I mean, this is, this is legit. 
And so from that point on, it's Cousin Wally and Cousin Sherry that not only do our lives connect way back in the 1800s and early 1900s at a little Lutheran church, but we're pretty sure that with the help of ancestry DNA at some point, it will be proven that we literally are distant cousins. That's how things go. It's amazing to think about way, way, way back in the past that God, when this was frontier land in America, there were already those who, as they were spreading westward, were establishing themselves in Christian congregations, and that God was establishing his people, and he was calling them out of darkness into his marvelous light, and he promises to sustain them and bless them to the very end of the age. Well, their congregation, like ours has gone through a a situation where they are becoming an independent Lutheran congregation. And so as we've networked with this church, I've realized that we can be a support to them and, and they can be an inspiration to us. 1840 or 1995, the same thing is true as it was in the first century A.D., God establishes his church. He lays claim to his people through the water and through the word of baptism. He gives us his spirit, and that spirit moves us forward as the people of God to the very end of the age. You see, in Acts chapter 2, it's an interesting story that Karen read for us this morning in our first reading. And it speaks of this day of Pentecost, which would have been the 50th day after Jesus' resurrection and the 10th day after Jesus had ascended into heaven. And it says in Acts chapter 2 that the disciples were all together in one place. And then did you hear the strange sound? It was a (sighs) sudden gust of a violent wind. And did you see the strange sight? Tongues of fire atop their heads. And then did you hear an even stranger sound? A bunch of different languages being spoken. And I realize to this very day people find that strange. It was truly strange when this happened, when those staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing believers from every nation under heaven heard the sound. They came together in bewilderment because they were hearing the message in their language that they could understand. And God be praised, each person was amazed, and they were wondering, how is it that these Galileans, these simpletons from up north in Galilee, can speak in languages that all of us can understand? And some of them stood on the sidelines and were cynics and said, these guys have been hitting up Mallow Run way too much. They've been down doing the Oliver Winery tour. They've been hitting the bottle. They're drunk. And yet, what is the response to that? It's only nine in the morning. They're still serving breakfast at McDonald's. These guys aren't drunk. But this is what had been promised in the Old Testament through the prophet that there would come a day when the Holy Spirit would be poured out. It would be in the last days. And both men and women, sons and daughters will prophesy and see visions and dream dreams. And on all of God's servants, both men and women, His Spirit would be poured out. And there would be wonders above and signs on the earth below. And the sun turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the glorious day of the Lord Jesus Christ. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls, Jesus, save me, will be called out of darkness into the marvelous light of Jesus. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's a strange sight. It's a strange sound. And yet it is the same Spirit of God who dwells in us who dwelt in them. I love that. That we have a changeless God even when we live in a changing world. That there is one message that we have been called to proclaim and that that one Holy Spirit sent by the Father and Son enabled our forebearers to proclaim that one message and now enables you and me to proclaim it too. That the message is Jesus Christ. And no matter the way, no matter the language, no matter to whom we speak it, the message is always one. 
the living Lord Jesus Christ. Several years ago, I read Billy Graham's autobiography that is called Just As I Am. And I love the story of Billy Graham. I love how God used him in his generation to reach the world for Christ. And in this story, Billy Graham talks about all of the sermons that he had preached over the years and all the continents of the world translated into so many different languages with so many different titles and texts on which he based his sermons. And yet he says in his book that really he only ever preached one message, and that was that we are sinners, that Christ died for us, that by believing in him we have eternal life, therefore repent and receive the good news. That's it. Billy Graham said it was one simple message, and that's what I want my life to reflect too. And I want that for our church. One message, Jesus Christ. And no matter the language that we speak or the way in which we proclaim it and to whom we tell it, that one message never changes. Some of you have been blessed to go into lands that are not your own, Maybe you've gone to India. Maybe you've gone to Haiti. Maybe you've gone to El Salvador. Maybe you've traveled down to downtown Indy. Or maybe you've gone far, far, far south to New Albany. Or maybe you've crossed the street in your neighborhood and you encountered someone who did not know Jesus Christ. And through your actions and through your words and always being prepared to give an answer for the reason of the hope that you have within you, with gentleness and with respect, you loved your neighbor as yourself. And through that love, you communicated the one message of Jesus Christ. That is powerful. Don't ever, ever, ever think that you don't make an impact upon this world. That through a variety of ways, in many different languages, to all the people of the world, we have one message that we bring. I think sometimes in the church we debate this idea of the speaking of tongues in tongues in Acts chapter 2. Some Christians say, well, yeah, people can still speak in tongues to this day, and others interpret tongues. Others say, no, that was a special thing in the earliest church where God needed to spread his message out to all of the different languages, but he doesn't do that in that way anymore. And so I know that Bible-believing, Jesus-loving Christians can debate that, but here is what is undebatable, that in our day and age, it is more than just what we say with our mouths that is a language. It is also the means that we use to reach different generations and peoples all over the world. I kind of wonder someday if God will give us insight into what it was like from His perspective to reign over all things, to see the past, to know the future, and yet be king over the present, and to look down over a pandemic that literally touched every nation on earth, and to look down and to see that the thief that John chapter 10 describes as the one who wants to steal and to kill and destroy was having a heyday with this pandemic. And the thief, the devil, wanted to come in and destroy the fabric of our families, who wanted to destroy the society in which we live, who wanted to destroy even our, our gathering as the people of God. And so Satan thought that he could win a victory. And yet I imagine the king sitting on high says, you dumb devil, I invented the internet. <laughs> and Al Gore says, but I, but I invented the internet. And he says, no, I invented the internet. <laughs> And God says, you know, devil, you've been trying this from the very beginning. You know, you've been gnawing at the heel of the ancient man, and you've been going after the heel of that ancient man's great, 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 great grandson, and you've been crushed at the cross, and you've been annihilated at the empty tomb. You're, you're thinking that you've won a victory, but you know what, Satan? You're done. You're done. And I will use this internet... And I will use this technology that I have given people in the 21st century and where you think you've scored a victory, O oh thief and kleptomaniac, I have come, John 10 verse 10, that they may have life and have it to the full. And where you think that you've scored a victory, I will take that gospel to the ends of the earth where every nation that has been affected by a pandemic 
called sin will know the beautiful, beautiful gift of a Savior who died that all may live. Do you see that? God be praised. God be praised that he is a changeless Christ for a changing world. And when he called his disciples to come together before he went up into heaven, he sent them out and he was blessing them. And Matthew 28 says that he gave them instructions that we would say are our marching orders. Go and make disciples. Of whom? Of all nations. What age? All nations. Everybody. What language? All nations. Where do they live? All nations. What color of skin? All nations. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them. And I will be with you always to the very end of the age. How did they know that he was with them always? Ten days after he ascended, the Spirit of God filled their hearts, filled their mouths, filled their lives, fills the world because we have been giving the marching orders it's time to go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. There's places to go. There's people to see. There's work to be done. Let's go. And as we do, we proclaim the greatest news of all, that there is new life in the living Lord Jesus. And today reminds us of that, that the same Spirit who filled the ancient followers of Christ fills you and me also and gives us new life, abundant life each and every day. For the thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. But what did Jesus say? I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. May we receive that life and may we make that life known in Jesus' name. Amen.